the Columbia Jane Doe, identified as Virginia Higgins Ray. This case involves a woman that mimics some of the stories that I've covered before of the living John and Jane Doe's. It's not clear exactly when the decedent was admitted into the South Carolina State Hospital, but we know that she was suffering from schizophrenia, and it was severe enough that she was unable to even give her name, although she did give a date of birth as January 31st, 1944. And this would have made her 38 on February 15th, 1982, at which time she suffered an accident and passed away. Prior to the hospitalization, they said that she'd been wandering the streets and preaching to people. She would tell everyone that she was the daughter of televangelist Oral Roberts. Because they were never able to determine her real identity, she was buried as a Jane Doe, but they didn't give up on identifying her. And the final identification came in May of 2023. This was after receiving a grant from the Dean and Tina Lynn Klaus Memorial Fund. For those who aren't aware, Dean and Tina were recently identified themselves, and a case I covered here even. And it turns out the Klaus family in part chose to fund this because somebody in their own family had schizophrenia, and that through their tragedy, they helped identify somebody else. This one was a hard one for them to come up with her identity. It led to a small North Carolina community, but it actually was pinpointed on 11 different trees within that community. So they had trouble picking it apart and figuring out who the missing woman was. They did finally come to the conclusion that she was, in fact, Virginia Clyde Higgins Ray, and she was 38 years old when she passed. And while I don't have her exact date of birth, it does mean that she was the age that she said she was when she passed away. Virginia was raised in Wilkesboro, North Carolina. She married and became a mom, and according to those who knew her, she was a really devoted mother, and they would say she delighted in her children. She was also a devout Christian. Her daughter has been searching for her mother now, ever since she was a child. She would go on to say that she's counted 42 Mother's Days that have passed since she went without her mom. She never gave up on finding out what happened to her. It appears that due to her schizophrenia, she ended up in the hospital pretty close to when she went missing from her family. It sounds like she'd been functioning pretty well day to day before whatever that final break was. And there's no indication why she decompensated so fast. An additional point is also the age of onset for schizophrenia is usually younger than this. It usually happens age 16 to 30 or so, but often in the mid-20s is when there are notable changes and people are able to start to pinpoint what is going on. Although, of course, these are always just averages, and someone in my own family actually developed symptoms in her 40s, so you just don't know for sure. Just generally, it happens earlier on. Thankfully, the hospital in the state continued trying to identify her. Because this is a really unusual John or Jane Doe type story, I can see how it might have fallen through the cracks, so it's a huge relief that they kept pushing and did all they could to find who she was. When asked about the memories of her mother, One of her children said that, in spite of the decades, all of the children remember her very much the same way, and that they describe as sunshine and picnics, saying when their mom was around, it was always sunny and she was really good to them. Virginia went unidentified for 41 years. Had she lived, she would be 79 years old today. The Hale County Jane Doe identified as Deborah Denise Terrell, also known as Deborah Mackey. This one starts in the desert outside of Plainview, Texas, in Hale County. She was found on February 16, 1982. It's believed that our Jane Doe was about 4'9 to 5'2 or 145 to 157 centimeters. She weighed about 95 to 100 pounds or 43 to 48 kilograms. Her hands had been tied behind her back, and her skull was missing from the scene. They would later estimate that she'd been there about a month. Once they found her, it obviously became very important that they find her missing skull, and they believe that they did. The crazy thing is that a skull was found pretty close to where she was, with no other remains with that. So then a pathologist named Ralph Erdman would go on to state that he was 95% certain that the skull that was found in Scottsdale matched the Plainview set of remains. 
based on similarities and the postmortem interval. The thing about this, though, is that Ralph Erdman, the man who determined this, he shortly after this would face his own scandal, and it kind of ripped apart all of the cases that he'd worked on. For about a decade, he did over 3,000 autopsies, and he made about $150,000 a year doing so. Maybe a little more like 140. This was in the 80s, in the early 90s. That's a lot of money, especially when you consider that it was all a lie, or at least a lot of it was. What happened is he was really well respected until 1991, and then he did an autopsy on a man named Robert Craig Newman. That man's autopsy included the weight of his spleen and his gallbladder. But the problem being, when a family member viewed the results of his autopsy, he knew that Robert Newman did not have a spleen. So it included a weight of something that wasn't there. So after this allegation was made, they exhumed the man's remains, and what they discovered was that an autopsy hadn't even been performed. The man's body was buried intact. Not even one cut had been made. So now they were worried about how competent he was and about fraud in all of the cases that he'd worked on. And it also came out that he had actually misplaced the head of someone else. And in that case, the head that disappeared had the bullet. That meant the cause of death disappeared too. As a result, the perpetrator got off scot-free. The evidence was gone. Around this time, Lubbock County started being targeted with lawsuits. And the county would pay out several times. They discovered there were falsified records that led to a man going to prison for the accidental drowning of an infant. Another man was on death row for two years based on testimony from Erdman that was later proven to be false. There's probably so much more than is even known, too. So usually I'm more forgiving about people who, in doing the estimates, gave a wrong race. But in this case, there's no way to even assume that it was in good faith. So as a result, because they said that the remains was that of a white woman, Deborah Mackey's family went 41 years without knowing what happened to her. And maybe it didn't have to. Who knows if he even actually examined the skull. Erdman would eventually plead no contest to seven felony charges. He got probation and community service. He paid a mere $17,000 for botching autopsies and lying about them. And this was in part to cover the cost of those they had to exhume to try to piece together what his incompetency had done. But that's just a small amount of money if you consider what they paid out in addition to his large salary. So they would eventually do DNA testing on our Jane Doe here. But before they even did that, in 2015, the quick examination already concluded it was a black female. And then once the DNA was done, it proved that second examination was correct. They had a hard time getting DNA that was suitable for genetic genealogy, but they did eventually successfully get it. Along the way, they had already begun to suspect, after the race was changed, that the young Jane Doe was in fact Deborah Terrell, and this would eventually be proven true. Deborah was just 20 years old when she disappeared from Lubbock, Texas, on New Year's Day, 1981. She had gone to a party at her mother's house on the 1700 block of Avenue E, at the end of the night, she was observed getting into a car with an unknown man around 2 a.m. He wasn't somebody who'd been at the party, and no one knows for sure who it was. When she was last seen, she had on a checkered brown coat, green pants, and she was wearing a bandana on her head. It's not clear if she was still married at the time, but 20-year-old Deborah had been married at a very young age. She was 15 when she had a child with a man who was much, much older. Deborah's family insisted from the beginning that she would never walk away from her child, who at this time was in elementary school. They were adamant that something bad had happened to her, but the police, for their part, settled on a theory that she'd walked away from her life, changed her name, and was living somewhere else. But there was no proof of this. They did eventually waver on this theory years and years later, after Deborah never contacted anyone in her family again. In the following years, the police themselves began to suspect she was a victim of foul play. Although her remains were found really close by, the misidentification based on race meant that nobody considered that Deborah had already been found. Unfortunately, no one knew that the coroner was incompetent. So exactly what happened to her, we don't know. We don't know if the COD has been identified, but if it has, they haven't released it. They do say that it was foul play. There's also a reward for the identification or arrest of the people involved. Please call the crime line that is listed here if you know anything at all about this case. 
you can always leave anonymous tips with these police departments too if you don't want anyone to know who you are. Deborah Mackey has gone unidentified for 41 years. Had she lived the life she deserved, she'd be 61 years old today. The Lovelock Jane Doe, identified as Florence Charleston. This story begins on October 26, 1978. An individual was walking along the north side of Scosa Road, about 40 feet off of the actual road itself. This was near Lovelock, Nevada. It was here that they spotted a folding bag that was partially buried. What they had actually found was the remains of a woman who had originally been buried inside of a shallow grave. This is probably a good time to remind people that when they're out walking in areas that are off the beaten path, please always keep an eye out. The truth is that so many of these John and Jane Does are found by accident. So in this case, the Pershing County Sheriff's Office responded to the scene and they noted that skeletal remains were located inside of a garment bag buried in a shallow grave. Investigators collected a variety of evidence that was found at the scene, including women's clothing, her remains were taken to Reno, Nevada, where an autopsy was performed. Investigators would conclude that she was white and likely around 40 to 50 years old. Unfortunately, the COD could not be determined. They tried really hard to identify her, but it just didn't happen. In May of 1979, the Pershing County Sheriff's Office requested help from the state in hopes that maybe they could identify her. The Nevada Department of Public Safety Investigations Divisions then took up the identification, or at least the attempt to. They used dental records for comparison purposes, and they tried to reach out to local area dentists in hopes she would be identified, but it didn't happen. They then did a facial reconstruction, and once advances happened, they processed her DNA and uploaded it into NamUs. They then diligently followed up on all the tips that were submitted. They'd done pretty much all they could, but they hit a wall, so they eventually sought out the assistance of Othram Labs. And of course, Othram is behind so many of these identifications. In June of 2023, they finally had her name. Florence Charleston was from Cleveland, Ohio, but she had just recently moved to Portland, Oregon, and this was where she went missing in 1978. And of course, now we know this is the same year that her remains were found in Lovelock, Nevada. It's not clear how she got from point A to point B, but the two locations are a distance of about 574 miles, or 924 kilometers. In 1978, this might as well have been another country because there were no centralized databases. The different jurisdictions just did the best that they could. A really sad part of this case is that her immediate family passed in the years that went by without knowing what happened to her. Her niece is still alive, though, and she believes that she was around 18 when her father told her that her Aunt Florence, who she called Aunt Dolly, had moved to Oregon and that she had moved with a new boyfriend. This would mean it was in the early 1970s, which would leave a gap of around eight years, if she's remembering the timeline correctly. She believes that no one in her family heard from Aunt Dolly again from that point on, saying that she's always remembered Aunt Dolly fondly over the years and wondered about her, hoping that she was happy and safe, saying all these questions I had and it turns out she was dead. Florence's remains were found in October of 1978. Her niece says her Aunt Dolly would have been about 68 years old, which is of course older than the estimation that was given. Though it's possible she had passed during that gap and that she had just been there longer than is known. Her niece shared that a Nevada State Police detective called her, saying that he'd taken over a cold case in October of 2022. He explained to her that it had been dormant for 40-plus years, and he wanted to ask her about a set of 45-year-old human remains that had been found, and her immediate response was to ask if he'd found her Aunt Dolly. It was shortly after this that a DNA test from Florence's niece was provided to Othram Labs, and it was declared that her Aunt Dolly had finally been found. Her niece would say this fired her up with hopes that she will learn what happened to Dolly. Florence Charleston went unidentified for 44 years. Huge thanks for watching all the way to the end, and a big thanks to all of you who consistently like and comment on the videos. 
The whole dance with YouTube is hard sometimes. Whether you leave a full comment or an emoji, it makes a huge difference. It's a huge push toward the videos being suggested to new people. The next goal is 20,000. Thanks everyone for watching. Take care of yourselves and each other.